Hello again and welcome to The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers. We're here several times a week on this station to bring you topical information and interviews with people we think that you will find interesting. And that's who we've got today. That's what we've done again today. And by the way, happy anniversary. What anniversary is that? This is our the fifth anniversary of our taping The Verdict. Wonderful. Happy five years yeah, to you. Way to go, Kent. Well, way to go yourself. You've been <laughs> in on all of them. Uh, today, we're celebrating our fifth anniversary with uh, inviting Jerome Holmes. Jerome is a former United States Attorney for the Western District of Oklahoma. Uh, he uh, was in charge of the anti-terrorism effort on the part of the U.S. Attorney's Office. He had a lot of other responsibilities. He's had quite a fascinating career in his relatively uh, young life compared to you and me. And uh, he's on his way to bigger and better things. But we are pleased that we're going to have uh, Jerome talking about anti-terrorism activity, talking about public corruption, talking about hate crimes and what's involved in prosecuting those. He'll be telling us a lot about what's going on in U.S. Attorney's Office. Jerome Holmes coming up next on The Verdict. For one Oklahoma-based company, success didn't happen overnight. Initially, the days were long, 80-hour weeks common. As we grew, we wanted to share our success, and the ideals of corporate and civic responsibility found a welcome home. Today, we're the largest investor in the Sooner State, and a source for exciting, new, high-quality jobs. We're Chesapeake Energy, committed to building a better Oklahoma. All children deserve a life of hope and love, but sometimes they experience a life of pain, neglect, and abuse. When that happens, each child deserves all the quality, assistance, and representation that can be offered in our legal system. For more information, call 23CHILD. Oklahoma Lawyers for Children, helping to bring hope and love back to the lives of abused children. Here at Diffie Ford Lincoln Mercury, located on I-40 just west of the Metro, we are expanding our entire product line. That's right, Aunt Chris. We have five incredible groups of imports. We have Toyota, Honda, Nissan, Kia, and Hyundai. The selection and our prices have never been better than right now. It's true, because we have prices slashed for this new group of pre-owned imports. Come out today and experience our new variety of cars with the Diffie family difference. Welcome back to The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers. Kent's going to introduce our guest. Today we are very pleased to have Jerome Holmes, the former United States Assistant District Attorney for the Western District of Oklahoma, joining us. Uh, Jerome is a graduate uh, with honors uh, from Wake Forest University. He got his law degree from Georgetown University, where he was editor-in-chief of uh, the Environmental Law Review, I believe it was. Uh, he went on to get a master's in public administration from Harvard University. He has been in private practice in Washington, D.C. He has been a law clerk both at the, for a district judge and for a court of appeals judge. Uh, he uh, was a former United States, uh, uh, assistant United States district attorney in the Western District for 11 years. He is now back in private practice and I'm pleased to say a, a partner of mine. Uh, Jerome, welcome to The Verdict. I'm delighted to be here, Kent. Thank I, you. I've been wanting to ask you, and you'd think I'd know, but I truly don't. How in the world did you get to Oklahoma, considering your educational background and where you grew up and all? Well, originally Washington, D.C. was home. Now Oklahoma is home. I came out here in 1988 to pursue a federal judicial clerkship. Uh, as you know, those are highly sought after positions, and I applied nationwide. Uh, to judges that I thought I wanted to work for, and I was very fortunate that uh, Judge Wayne Alley, who, is in, who was at that time in the trial bench here in Oklahoma City, uh, liked me well enough to hire me, and I came out, and with a brief detour back to Washington, D.C., I came back to God's country and have been very happy to be here. We're glad you did. U.S. Attorney's Office deals with a variety of issues. One of them is public corruption. Do you have anything specific you could say about public corruption in this state, in your district, and, and, and what you think about it? Absolutely. Uh, public corruption, I perceive, 
as one of the most repugnant forms of crime. And it was one of the areas of activity in which I was involved as a prosecutor. And the reason I say that is it has significant, at least the potential for significant societal effects, both in terms of chilling honest business people who just want to engage uh, in business on a level playing field as opposed to paying kickbacks and bribes to public officials, and from a perspective of uh, fostering distrust uh, and cynicism in our electorate, which uh, we count upon to participate in our system. And so reaching out and dealing with those public officials who violate their trust was something that I viewed as very important, and I was very proud to be a part of that in the U.S. Attorney's Office. Uh, I can't really say sitting here that the problem is greater in Oklahoma than it is in other states, and I'm glad for that, but we have had, of course, our own dramatic instances mm -hmm. of it, both uh, the Supreme Court bribery scandal in the, the 1960s, mid-1960s, and the county commissioner scandal in the 80s, and more recently, one that I was personally involved in, uh, the Department of Health uh, scandal. Uh, in which Brent Van Meter uh, was involved in taking bribes and uh, kickbacks from people, and I personally was involved in prosecuting uh, Mr. Van Meter in uh, October of 2000. It seems to me, though, that in some instances there's, there's a culture where this seems to occur. In other words, if there's one agency or one state who seems to have a little bit of a problem, it kind of is an infectious. Do you, do you see that? Well, you use the word culture, and I think the word culture has uh, great significance here, because I think that you can start down a slippery slope in which uh, people, in which leaders foster a culture of looking the other way. They foster a culture of small things that grow into larger uh, corruption. And, and what you find, that is why it's so important to deal with the leadership who is involved in engaging in illegal acts and let it be known, sending a signal to people in agencies that they cannot allow it to happen. And in the Van Meter case, uh, one of the things that was of great concern to us, and when you bring those cases, you can't lose, because if you lose, you send the wrong message to folks out there that they can actually come forward and know that they'll be protected, that, these, that there are honest people out there in government who want to see them be able to do their job without uh, the problems that you see associated with corruption. John, let me change the subject sure. uh, to uh, terrorism. I know uh, in your service, particularly the last couple of years there, you were the anti-terrorism coordinator for your office. Just how much activity on a daily or weekly or monthly basis uh, were you involved in in, in uh, trying to prevent terrorism in Oklahoma? Well, it kept me uh, quite busy. Uh, I think that uh, what we have in Oklahoma certainly is not the level of threat as a general matter that you might perceive in places like uh, Detroit or New York City or places of that sort. But the reality is that, uh, that one of the things the Oklahoma City bombing on the domestic front brought home to us was simply the notion that no place is really immune from terrorist threats. And on the international terrorism front, what you, one needs to be aware of and cognizant of is that there are people out there who don't like us. I mean, and, there people, and by us, I mean Americans and, and what we stand for as a way of life. And so uh, one had to be involved, uh, one had to be engaged and focused on the notion of detecting possible threats before they mushroomed into something else. Mm -hmm. Let me carry sure. forward a little more follow-up on what you and your office did. I suppose uh, the FBI is involved in anti-terrorism activities and other agencies. Uh, you, you had to deal with those people, I suppose, on a regular basis. I dealt with them on a regular basis, indeed, and, and they were fine public servants, uh, indeed. And, and the FBI took the lead. They're, they're a joint terrorism task force. They have them in every district field office, every FBI field office in the nation. And those task forces are composed of the FBI and a number of other um, federal and state and local entities that are out there designed to, uh, with a mission of focusing on possible terrorist threats and running down leads as it relates to them. And they interacted heavily with the U.S. Attorney's Office and in particular the anti-terrorism coordinator and essentially using the court system and court process to follow up on possible leads of, of uh, terrorist-related activity. Using provisions of the Patriot Act, I suppose. Well, in part, yes, and also traditional tools associated with uh, grand jury subpoenas and that sort of thing. Okay. You know, moments after the Oklahoma City bombing, it was identified as a crime scene and it started a series of events that led with the, the prosecution. 
Um, you were very much involved in working with the prosecution team. What were your, what were your impressions of the prosecution team that worked on the Oklahoma City bombing case? Uh, a very dedicated uh, group of people and a very committed group of people. I, I, one of the things that I treasure is that time. And I treasure it uh, <coughs> despite the fact that I lost a lot of sleep during that time okay. and, and had to put a lot of other things to the side because it was a very fulfilling period in which we knew that we were involved in addressing what at the time seemed to be quite a cataclysmic event and still is in retrospect, and, and we wanted to do it right. It needed to be done under the rule of law, and it needed to be done, however, in a way that was aggressive and, and vigorous in terms of uh, representing the interests of the United States and representing the interests of the victims involved, and, and we did that. And we had some fine lawyers and some fine investigators out doing their job and, and trying to make sure that uh, the right people were brought to justice, and they, in fact, were. You mentioned in the public cor corruption uh, issue that you felt like you have to win. I assume you had that we have to win attitude when uh, you were going after the, the bombing suspects. Absolutely, and let me qualify that only to say that you have to win when you're doing things in an ethical and right way. I mean, the bottom line is you got to do things uh, in a way that upholds justice because that's ultimately what our end game is. But once you establish that bottom line, my, my view was uh, I'll work out those issues, And but when you walk in that courtroom, you should have worked out those issues, and, mm -hmm. and the bottom line is at that point, yes, you have to use your lawyerly skills and you have to win. Jerome Holmes is a former U.S. assistant attorney. He'll be back with more on the verdict when we get back. The Journal Record is pleased to be a sponsor of the verdict. The Journal Record, since 1903, the best source of Oklahoma business news and legal information. American Express Tax and Business Services. We're accountants. We do taxes, business valuations, estate planning, and consulting. And we're right here in Oklahoma, working with the owners of small and medium-sized businesses. Steve Wilsey and Stuart Meyer have the resources and the experience. American Express Tax and Business Services. In Oklahoma City, the phone number is 405-843-5311. Mick Cornett and Kent Myers, as always, on The Verdict. Today's guest is Jerome Holmes. He's a, a former assistant U.S. attorney. Kent, where do you want to go here? Let's talk a little bit about uh, your activity in civil rights matters, uh, police misconduct. We all remember here in Oklahoma City some rather vivid videotape of, uh, of uh, uh, alleged uh, criminal being uh, beaten by police with sticks and all. And, of course, none of us can forget the Rodney King uh, activities out in Los Angeles. When those things arose, I guess, in the Western District of Oklahoma, you got the phone call. I did indeed. And what, tell us uh, what you did after you got the phone call and how those things progressed. Uh, for several years in the U.S. Attorney's Office, I had the uh, point, if you will, as the intake person on criminal civil rights matters. Uh, one of the areas in which the federal government is heavily involved is uh, civil rights matters, both in the form of police misconduct and alleged excessive force cases, but also in the context of hate crimes. Uh, it has been viewed that uh, the federal government brings a certain detachment and brings resources to that uh, uh, ex examination of those possible issues. And so as it relates to uh, matters of excessive force, uh, th those calls would come to me. And they are tough, they're tough investigations. Uh, the FBI does a great job in putting together material uh, for prosecutors to make the ultimate prosecutorial call on those matters. Yeah, you don't always and have videotape. You don't always have videotape, and sometimes videotape doesn't tell you the full story. Because the, the reality is that in instances in which people 
uh, tussle with the police in which people resist. Uh, there are very tough cases to come back and second, second guess the police as to whether they use the appropriate amount of force uh, to protect themselves and to protect the public. Uh, they often those cases don't go anywhere as criminal matters because of that because what you are called upon to do is decide essentially whether you're going to put an officer in jail for something that is a split-second decision at the time and, in, and which is not to say that you don't review it carefully is not to say that you aren't uh, concerned about vindicating the civil rights of the individuals involved but you have to make those decisions very carefully and and the when you look at videotapes sometimes it, it can really not give you a full sense of what was going on at the time. Let me ask you a follow-up question to that. Uh, I don't know how many uh, police officers we have in Oklahoma City or in the county as well, but we have a lot of law enforcement officers and they're out there seven days a week, uh, 365 days a year, and yet the number of times we hear about alleged uh, uh, excessive force it seems to me to be very small in comparison to the number of incidents that they're involved in where perhaps force has to be involved. Uh, do you find a level of professionalism in this community that is, uh, is something to be proud of? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It, it's my impression that uh, the number of instances, as a, and it is only a rough impression, but uh, the number of instances that would ever hit my desk, uh, when you uh, compare that to the number of uh, instances in which the officer interacts with the public, uh, is minuscule. And even those instances that would hit my desk are, sent, are often instances in which there has been significant bodily injury to the individual involved, but the question is why? And, and, the, and the answer is uh, I found very seldom, at least as a provable matter, and I think in most instances as a matter of fact as well, uh, a situation in which the officer went beyond what they needed to do. The prosecution of hate crimes, what's involved there? Um, the prosecution of hate crimes, and, I, and knock on wood, I think that the number of instances of that uh, in uh, the Oklahoma area, the Western District of Oklahoma that I was responsible for, uh, have been uh, relatively small. Uh, they run the gamut from uh, the cross-burning cases in which we did have one of those uh, that was a successful prosecution to instances in which people are assaulted uh, on grounds of race or, or religion or nationality or color. Um, again, they are very, uh, they're very difficult cases uh, both to prove uh, and to establish. And well, you have to prove intent, I would you assume, have to to, prove in some intent. cases. You do, and, and the difficult thing and, and the misconception sometimes on that issue is that in the federal system, it is not just enough to have the intent to do the harm to somebody because they fall into one of those groups. Uh, under the major federal civil rights statutes, they have what they call a dual intent requirement. Not only do you have to want to harm somebody because they are either black or because of their color or something of that sort, but also because you're deprived because you're depriving them of certain rights. So, for example, I would have to want to beat you up not only because you're black, but because I don't want you in a public park. And the state provides the public park, and because the state provides a public park, you have those two things you have the violation but if I walked into your home and beat you up because you were black it's not necessarily clear that we'd have a federal crime although the state has the state fortunately in Oklahoma has a certain hate crime statute but it's it's a misdemeanor uh, for certain violations let me ask you about one that uh, I'm not sure is a hate crime or not but recently there was a prosecution about a fellow that threw a firebomb at a synagogue uh, here I think in this district and as a matter of fact, uh, speaking of videotape, I think he taped himself doing it, which uh, didn't turn out to be the smartest thing he could do. Uh, is, was that prosecuted as a hate crime? I, I tried, Mr. Gillespie, and that's the person you're referring to. I that see. was my last case in the U.S. Attorney's Office. And Mr. Gillespie uh, was not the wisest man in uh, videotaping <laughs> himself uh, undertaking that. Uh, we actually uh, made the decision not to pursue it under these traditional civil rights statutes. Uh, but prosecuted Mr. Gillespie under certain firearm statutes and they carried a very, very heavy punch indeed. Uh, and uh, one of the statutes had a mandatory minimum sentence of 30 years and, and as it turned out his sentence was uh, 
I, I believe something like 36 or 38, I don't recall exactly what it was because they sentenced him after I left the office, but, but it was at bottom, yes, a hate crime. Uh, the, uh, as came out in evidence, Mr. Gillespie had, uh, uh, he disliked essentially anybody who wasn't white, uh, he, and he particularly had uh, a hostility towards Jews. And as it turned out, he firebombed the synagogue, Temple B'nai Israel, over on Pennsylvania Avenue. And, uh, and he was, that was a very good prosecution indeed, and he was a dangerous man. Just briefly, you're no longer in the U.S. Attorney's Office, you're in private practice, and I'm pleased about that personally. But uh, do you find it difficult shifting from government employment to private employment, particularly if you practice in the same area, at least on the other side of the table, that you were occupying when you were in the U.S. Attorney's Office? What kind of tension does that put on you? Um, really very little. I, I mean, I am a firm believer in the adversary system, uh, and, and I do believe that although I tried very hard and, and to be fair when I was a prosecutor and to be situated to make sure the defendant's rights were protected, the reality was is that uh, I was not his advocate, uh, and it was not my job to put his case in the best light possible. It was not my job to humanize that defendant and to do those things that a good advocate will do for their client and it, and it was not my job to contest issues that I frankly as a prosecutor on my side thought should go the way of the government but but they were they were uh, could be debatable points uh, and so it's it's appropriate to have someone on the other side who can be a champion and I have no problem doing that Jerome we are out of time sure appreciate you coming on the show well I'm delighted to be here thank you mayor Jerome Holmes former assistant thank US you. attorney thank you. our guest today on the verdict Kent and I'll be back with a final word when we return. Okiwani is an Indian name for a place where children play. When we obtained the camp, we found a lot of oil debris left in the woods. We saw a commercial about how the oil and natural gas industry cleans up old oil well sites. We called the OERB and they agreed to remove tons of concrete and steel. It didn't cost us a thing. Thousands of children have left their footprints on this land. Thanks to the oil and gas industry, they will for a long time to come. Bringing out the best in each student, that is the simple goal and tradition of Heritage Hall. The focus on the individual shapes the educational experience at Heritage Hall. Each student benefits from small classes, able, dedicated teachers, a solid academic curriculum, and exceptional co-curricular programs of athletics, arts, community service, and other activities, parental involvement, personalized counseling, and the development of responsibility, integrity, and love of learning. If you want education taught with pride, then you want Heritage Hall. Welcome back to The Verdict. Mick Cornett and Kent Myers. Jerome Holmes, former U.S. or former assistant U.S. attorney, was our guest today. What a fascinating person. Well, he really is. Has a fascinating background, is quite articulate, and is really a heck of a trial lawyer. Uh, I think uh, he'll do fine no matter which side of the table he's on. <laughs> he's, he's done very well in his life uh, so far, and I'm sure he's going to continue to do so. Uh, we're going to have a show uh, next week. Uh, that uh, we'll bring to you uh, Senator Mike Morgan, the new President Pro Tem of the Oklahoma Senate, took over halfway through the session this last uh, session in uh, 2005, and Mike will be joining us to talk about what he expects uh, in the upcoming session and what tensions there'll be out at the legislature. And there will be. There will be. There will be some. You can you can bet on that. Hey, if you've got an idea for a show that you'd like to see on the verdict, here's what you need to do: just go to our website, theverdict.tv. Send us an email, tell us what you'd like to see, and I bet you we can work it out. For Kent Myers, I'm Mick Cornett. We'll see you next week on The Verdict.
The preceding program was produced by the Production Services Group at Cox Communications, exclusively for the Cox Channel.